That's the thing that the government has never really wanted talked about, about Silk Road, was whether you like it or not, whether you agree with it or not, it was a political engine. Its, its motive was purely political. Hello. Thank you for coming out. <clears throat> uh, so, uh, first of all, I thought it was a great film. Oh, thank you. Um, one of the best documentaries I've ever seen, I think. Oh, wow, jeez. And well, bottle that. you tell a very complicated story. Uh, it's complicated in a number of ways, mm -hmm. um, politically and otherwise. Um, the technology explaining a lot of that. And you do it very clearly and accessibly, and I was fairly blown away. Oh, thank you. Uh, I got here about 20 minutes ago. It's so depressing walking in at the end of this movie. <laughs> Oy, what did we do? So how, I mean, first of all, so how did you, how did how's you... How's that for an uplift? How did you, <laughs> how did you get to this project? I mean, clearly uh, it takes a lot a of passion to go through all that work. Uh, I'll try to keep this short. Um, I guess the short version is, is I, I got interested in the internet in the 80s and... Uh, uh, this is the short version, I promise. Uh, saddle up. Um, and uh, I was interested in the BBS news group community, and, and uh, what I found fascinating at that time was, was not so much computers and technology, but uh, that there were these rapidly growing online communities that were really, uh, because of the freedom and anonymity of the internet and the newness of it, there was this sort of democratizing component where people really felt free to talk about anything. And so there was some very radical discourse going on at that time on the internet. Um, and you don't need to be on like uh, one of the hackers. There were a lot of hacker groups that were harder to get into. That's when I met Sean Fanning and Sean Parker later when I made the Napster movie. That's where those guys were. This is just straight up regular communities. Any idiot like myself could get into these. Anyway, they were very similar to what grew to become the darknet communities. And I've followed them through the years and uh, have just been very interested in, this, in the sort of more sociological uh, aspect of the growth of online community. So I wanted to tell stories in that space. So I made the Napster movie. And then when I watched the Silk Road happen, uh, 2012 is when I learned about it. And then when Ross was arrested in 13, it was really clear that to me that Silk Road was the next big seismic shift in uh, online communities. Napster was the first global internet community. That's really why it has significance. 100 million people online at once had never happened before. Silk Road was the first time you had a full scaling, efficient, anonymous online community. That was a water, it's a watershed moment and it's going to usher in a lot of change. So that's why I wanted to tell that story in a, in a nutshell. Um, at the, toward the end of the film, Andy Greenberg, who's the yeah. Wired reporter, but I think he's also a producer on the film, is that right? He was, yeah, he was like a consulting producer. He wrote a really great book called the, This Machine Kills Secrets that I'd read, which is sort of touted as a WikiLeaks book. It isn't really. It's really a fantastic book about the evolution of cryptography and the cypherpunks. Uh, so I knew I wanted him, him involved really early on. We got him involved. He says a, a, an interesting thing that also sort of confused me because he didn't quite spell it out. He said he's conflicted about the meaning of Silk Road and Ross Ulbricht, mm -hmm. and he didn't quite explain his conflict. I mean, I took him to be basically a partisan throughout the film of Ulbricht and Sil Silk Road and that general project. Mm -hmm. Then he says at the very end that he was actually conflicted about it. I'm wondering, I mean, do you know what he meant by that? And then I'm also wondering if you're conflicted about their meaning. I think that what, what Andy is saying, and, and you know, there's a lot that flies by in this movie, it's, it's it's evident in this in by the bluntness with which he says he agrees with the government's position on the case. It's very interesting, given the journey that he's been on, that he comes to that conclusion. He believes the government has proven that Ross is guilty, and so to him, Ross's DPR, Ross did all these things, and yet he was also this idealistic. This is Andy's, you know, uh, opinion that he's lived with this guy via DPR for so many years, for, for years in, very, very, in a very detailed uh, uh, micro fashion. And yet to have to reconcile the possibility that he had become potentially corrupted, that there were all these other nefarious things that had gone on, the, the breadth and scope of, of, of what had gone down on, on the Silk Road. 
left him in a really um, conflicted place uh, psychologically, and, and uh, which I find fascinating because you know, for me as a filmmaker, um, I was not actually um, conflicted because for me as an observer, having watched this whole thing happen, I didn't ever really get impacted by things that hadn't been proven in court. And, uh, and I know a lot about hackers, and so I, wasn't, I didn't totally swallow uh, everything that had been presented. And because Ross was never formally charged with attempted murder, and that was never proven in court, it, it never occurred to me to assume that, that um, emotionally to get invested in the idea that, that he had done those things, because I needed to see them proven. And, uh, and, I, and we never did get to see them proven. And so uh, from an ethical standpoint, it never even occurred to me to try to put forward a, a position that Ross was guilty of something that he had never had the opportunity to defend himself against in court. Uh, it just never crossed my mind. So um, I find Andy interesting, and I love Andy to death, but it's not actually a position I agree with. Um, and then on the other side, you have the parents who are vehement that Ross is 100% innocent. And the truth is probably somewhere between the two and in the middle and out in the ether. Point is, we don't know. We don't absolutely concretely know. The, the, the trial was abbreviated. I was there. It was very short. Uh, there was very little that got communicated. And there's a lot that I happen to know that we don't know that hasn't been made public. I mean, for those of us who more or less think he's a hero of some sort, I mean, we need him to be guilty, right? <laughs> he's not a hero unless he actually is guilty of the major charge of running Silk Road. Right. That seems to be fairly clear. It seems like most people involved in the case agree with that. Well, um, he, I mean, Ross even, admitted uh, to Even that. he admitted to Ross it, said yes. he, he, Ross has admitted to creating Silk Road. Ross's position is, I created Silk Road, I am not Dread Pirate Roberts. I, I created it, I got it up and running, it was a team effort, a community effort, and I bailed out. And I had a hand in it, and that's his position. Uh, we don't, we don't, I don't know any more than that, other than that, I do know uh, from my inside perspective that there were uh, several people that were running uh, the Silk Road on the Joe Pirate Roberts account. I know three of them. Um, but that doesn't mean necessarily, and you know, there could be a reality in which he ran it and gave the administrative, you know, password over to somebody because he couldn't be online 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So I thought, but I guess I'm wrong, I thought that what Greenberg was referring to in terms of his own conflict was over just the freedom that Silk Road offered, right? That there will be wonderful things, wonderful benefits from it, but also potentially quite dark uh, downsides to it. No, Andy and, likes all that. So, I mean, <laughs> you know, um, Andy's very pro the freedoms that the, that the, the internet offers, and he's very, uh, not to put words in his mouth, but just knowing him, he's, he's, you know, he sort of bemoans, as I do, uh, the ways in which the internet has gotten hobbled over the years. And like I said, like to me, to be on the BBS News Group era was very romantic, um, and, the, and the dark net, uh, is also very romantic, um, and it's been demonized, and there are bad things that happen there, just like there are bad things that happen anywhere human beings congregate. But uh, this notion of a privacy and anonymity-ridden, you know, or driven community that is mostly journalists and, you know, human rights organizations and, you know, government agents that need to be able to protect themselves, um, and a lot of people speaking uh, freely and wanting change. Um, is a romantic ideal. It's a dangerous one, and it's one that a lot of people want to see snuffed out. Yeah. I, so I'm a, a U.S. historian, and I couldn't help but be reminded of prohibition. Right. Yeah. And the uses of technology to basically subvert laws yeah. that we now all think should have been subverted, right? Um, like the car. Yeah, good example. Um, right. So the, the high-speed car that was used by bootleggers in the south and the, and the uh, speedboats that were used to bring booze through the Caribbean. Um, <coughs> and, you know, I, so I'm thinking there's definitely a parallel there, or it's analogous in some ways. And then I'm thinking, but, but these guys, as far as we know, didn't kill anybody. Right. But they serve the same purpose or are serving the same purpose. I think that what they will do to drugs is the same thing that the mafia did to alcohol in the 20s, which is basically subvert these laws, right? Yeah, I mean, the thing that's happening is, is you know, the drug war has given way to the Al Capones of today, which are not Ross. I mean, these gigantic cartels where, you know, you're dealing with billions of dollars of, of drug trade and ma mass murder on a massive scale and political upheaval. Those are the Al Capones of, of, of prohibition. I, yeah, I was thinking through this today. Uh, I watched the film earlier this morning, and then I was thinking through it. And it's sort of, it's, I guess the difference is that he didn't actually become a dealer himself, like the mafia did, right, in the 20s. 
he essentially just created an alternate world in which this trade could go on unrestricted, right? Yeah, I think that the categorical difference, there's two, two significant issues. One is the size. Is It was a big community. It's a tiny drug market. In the scheme of things, from a business standpoint and a law enforcement standpoint, there's, it's a puny, puny drug market. It's, not, it's a, a speck in the water of the drug trade. That's not why the Silk Road was a threat to law enforcement. Um, the, 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 the drive in the media and from law enforcement to, to present the Silk Road as this horrific, I mean, there were never hitmen on the Silk Road. There's never actually no hitmen on the dark net. If you see that in the, in the media, at, by this point, they actually know they're full of shit. They, there's no evidence of any hitmen. It's hyper, hyperbole. It's mostly trolls, like making fun of idiots who go online and look for people to kill people. But there's no evidence of anyone ever either advertising for legitimately or utilizing hitmen. So there's no real murder happening there. There's a, most of the drugs that were sold on Silk Road was pot. There wasn't a ton of any drug. But what I encountered in, in researching the movie, which was a surprise to me, is that everybody that I met within the Silk Road was political. So the difference in terms of what you're saying, a long way around to answer your question is, Ross is political. You know, if you dig into, you know, he's a very staunch libertarian, and everybody else that I interviewed, including the guy in red, um, who was one of the largest dealers on Silk Road and helped uh, scale the user interface, and he's still at large, so um, he's an interesting person, but he's p super political. Everybody there, they were there to uh, use technology to dismantle the drug war and to create uh, deregulated communities. So that's the thing that the government has never really wanted talked about about Silk Road was whether you like it or not, whether you agree with it or not, it was a political engine. Its, its motive was purely political. One of the charges against libertarianism and against, I suppose, internet users like this is that they are profoundly sort of anti-social, not just individualists, but they're anti-social. Right. And in a way, this film is an extended critique of that, right? That, that yeah. they, these people were actually primarily, you sort of end with that thing with Ross wishing for more connection with human beings. You know, it's sort of, the, it's this, the, the prime, seems in some way the primary motivation for him was community, to, to establish an alternative community, but to yes. be with people in a, very, in a virtual way. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the myth of the hoodie-wearing sociopathological hacker that we continually see in the media, I mean, is laughable. And, and I remember when I met Sean Fanning in 2000, when Napster was, was crumbling. And, um, you know, these guys, like, you know, these were the most social guys you'd ever met in your life. I mean, they, the, the myth about, about creating large technologies is that one person does it, you know? It's a guy in a hoodie with a laptop, like Mr. Robot, or, or the social network's portrayal of Zuckerberg, you know, as opposed to how these systems are actually created, which is by community. You can't mount a large-scale uh, technology like Silk Road, like Napster, like Amazon, without a massive community. And it's never one guy with a laptop. And usually, you know, like Zuckerberg is super social and not at all like he was portrayed and has had the same girlfriend since he was fairly, I mean, you know, they're not sociopaths. They're kind of, geek. they're smart, but they're kind of geeky guys. They have a lot of friends. It requires a lot of friends. It requires this huge network in order to build these. Uh, same with Silk, Silk Road, it was a community run operation. It was, that, that did not surprise me as I scratched the surface. I found this core community of people that have put that thing together. But that's anathema to the way uh, we want to present these narratives. You know, the idea that, that um, these are, are community sort of oriented people is anathema to the, to the prevailing narrative. One fact that is not in the film, um, which Kurt Loder told me about via Twitter today, and I think he told you too, um, was that I guess the judge in the case was recommended for nomination to the bench by Charles Schumer. Yeah, I had to keep my mouth shut about that all year long. That was so tough. Yeah, I mean, the network is really, I mean, you know, on a certain level, it's not surprising. Politics is, is politics. And, you know, a lot of people, when Ross got arrested and he got extradited from San Francisco to New York, they were like, when they saw that he was being tried in the Southern District of New York, they were like, he's totally fucked. And this was like a year and a half ago. Um, it's a very tight-knit community, you know, and Schumer and the DA and the prosecutor and the judge, I mean, they're a tight-knit community, and they're, 
the Southern District of New York tries a lot of financial regulation cases. There's a lot of people that believe this case is really a Bitcoin case, and it's really more about uh, the threat to Wall Street markets than it is to anything else in terms of the level of, of, of uh, commitment that they had in, in shutting this thing down and making an example out of Ross. I mean, you know, there's been a lot of articles written about that. You, you can look them up. But it's, uh, yeah, it's a very tight-knit community, and, and Schumer made it very clear that he wanted, you know, this to be dealt with in an extreme manner. And I noticed the, um, I forget his name, but I think the other congressperson who led the fight against Silk Road is also a Democrat. Man Manchin? Uh, um, yeah, something like yeah, that. Yeah, but it was the two of them, right? So it's sort of a... Well, you're also it, dealing with old, a, yeah. old school issues, old school drug war issues. You know, there's so many issues at play. It's really harrowing to watch a case like this happen. Like, sitting in the courtroom, you realize that once the button gets switched and the machine just kind of cranks into gear, it just, it's just unstoppable. And, you know, there was a kind of lumbering, almost thoughtlessness to it, to the way Ross is just kind of trampled into the dust. And it was really harrowing to watch. And, and the machine's set up. It's, it's set up to dismantle drug war issues. It's set up to dismantle cyber. Ross had the misfortune of getting stuck in the crosshairs of those two over-prosecuted areas in our judicial system, which is cyber and the drug war. He's smack in the middle of both, which never bode well for him. What's, what's the reaction to the film been? Well, it's been, you know, uh, varied. We've had a, overall a really, really great and positive reaction, which has been wonderful. Um, I knew the film would be contentious. We didn't set out to make it provocative, but we did set out to tell the story the way we saw it. And uh, we've been, you know, I've been in, all over the world with the movie, been invited to festivals all over the world. I'm really happy with the reviews that we got. Um, even people that don't like it, it seems to have hit a nerve with them. And I don't really, you know, I don't mean some flippant, but I don't care so much if someone likes a, a doc like this or not, as much as if they, you know, if their brains get kind of kicked into gear by it on some level, even if they vehemently disagree with the way we're presenting it, that's okay. Um, so it has, it has had a ripple effect, which I'm really happy about. I got a letter from Ross from prison last week, you know, where he said he's really, you know, again, whether you like him or not, and I have to caveat, I don't really know Ross. You know, Ross has been unattainable and inaccessible to me uh, because of the severity of the crime. But he wrote me this very astute letter the other day where he just said, you know, I'm not sure if this is going to have any impact on my appeal. Like, regardless of me, I'm getting all these letters in prison by people who didn't know anything about this world and about the drug war and about, you know, the way cyber is being over-prosecuted over and the way the darkness is being demonized. And he was just really happy to see that that, you know, I think it was satisfying to him to see that dialogue happening a little bit. Um, and I was happy to see that. Again, you know, I, it's, uh, we didn't set out to try to defend him. And... Uh, I don't really know enough to do that one way or the other. I do hope he gets an appeal. I do hope that we get to see a substantive case uh, trial anyway, uh, which we haven't seen yet. Great. Um, well, I'd love to take some questions, or we'd like to say, take some questions from the audience. Uh, no, there's no way. Uh, you can't legally interview them. Um, Even and after I, the fact? No, the reason I didn't pursue any of this after the fact was twofold. One was creative. I actually wanted the movie to end with the sentencing in terms of just being information. I mean, the story is just, what's happening with those two federal agents, there's so much more to the story. It's just beginning, right? Um, but it's a movie. I wanted it to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. I wanted that to be the end. So I didn't want to just keep interviewing people. Secondarily, to your point, specifically, if you had been in the courtroom like I was and you had seen the jury, you would not <laughs> not be that interested in interviewing them. You know, they were either asleep or, you know, reading stuff or looking really confused. But it was, you know, they, they didn't know what the hell, they had no idea what the hell was going on. I mean, they really didn't, so. Understood. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that that, you know, I was at the sentencing, and the sentencing was interesting because, you know, a lot of people don't like Ross. That's the thing about Ross, he's like a litmus test. He's either a libertarian hero or a crypto-anarchist revolutionary or an evil, drug-mongering, murderous thug. He's all these different things to all these people. So the sentencing, which had an overflow room, and there were so many people there, was filled with people with varied ideas about Ross. They were not, like, it was not a cheering se section by any stretch. But... 
everybody was blown away by the sentence. Everybody. People were like, there were all these sort of judiciary students, all these legal students that were in them. They were just freaking out when the sentence was read. And what was really chilling about the sentence, and I said this, I think I said this to Kurt after the, after the, uh, the sentencing, was like, I actually, believe it or not, I never really fell that hard on one side or the other. I just wanted to know what happened, you know? I, was it possible that Ross did all those things, including trying to have people killed? I don't know, it's possible. No one's proven it, they didn't even charge him with it in the end, but it's possible. But the sentencing, I had a hard and fast opinion about. It was, it was wrong, and it's excessive, and it doesn't fit the charges. So uh, I think it's helped him towards an appeal, but, uh, you know, Forrest was really clear. You know, the, it was a very long sentence. It went on for hours. We thought we'd be out of there in a half an hour. But she gave an almost hour-long speech about the merits of the drug war, why it needed to be upheld, and why Ross needed to be made an example of and how he had disturbed the social fabric of our society and how people who do use technology in this way are disrupting the social fabric of our society and we must use Ross as an example. So she just bluntly said that she was making an example out of him, which was a, you know, a fairly, fairly chilling thing to watch when the person's that young and you know they're going to be in a max. There's not that many max security prisons in America, so he's going to a fairly grim place for what, 60 years, 50 years? You know. Progressives led the movement for prohibition too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Because the, the, there was an argument early on, this is a question of tra transferred intent is the, is, the, is the issue of if you are, if you, uh, actually FedEx was charged or was attempted to be charged with this last year too where they were, uh, I think it was California, am I right about that? Uh, that, uh, that was claiming that FedEx should be held responsible for the drugs that were being moved and other contraband that was being moved through FedEx, even though FedEx was not aware of them, and, or, and if they were, which is what the court was, was suggesting, is that they actually were aware of them, uh, that they were not responsible. So there's been questions around whether Ross could be held responsible for the negative or criminal aspects of his site. The judge argued early on that transferred intent was not applicable because the Silk Road was clearly and even within its manifesto uh, created with a specific intent to traffic contraband. Uh, that's, uh, that's debatable. I, I think, um, honestly, I actually had this debate with someone in a Q&A recently who got very angry with me because I, I wouldn't fall hard on the side of, of Ross falling into the transferred intent debate because the Silk Road you can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't create a revolutionary technology and then say, but hey, I, I, you, know, it was, you can do whatever you want with it. It's, it was created as a revolutionary technology. So it's, if you do that, um, you can't be surprised if someone says, I'm going to slap your wrist for creating a revolutionary technology. It's happened, it happened in Napster on a much smaller <coughs> scale. But honestly, I think the two cases are extremely similar. Well, quickly, I found them, many of them, I found them through a bunch of different means. I, I have encryption and I was sending out sort of encrypted messages through various places that I knew would, they'd be read and a lot of people got in touch with me. I did a Kickstarter, a lot of people got in touch with me through PGP encryption because of the Kickstarter. People knew me because it downloaded and they knew that I cared about these issues, so they got in touch with me for that reason. Some people actually even knew back from the BBS era that were, were either political or moving drugs online back then, which is, was my first interaction with both drugs online and encrypted email was back in like nine, 1990. Um, some of those people were the same people who were architecting the Silk Road, which is not surprising considering how well it run. It wasn't just created by a 26 year old kid who had no technical skills. He had a team of people that, there were a team of people behind it that, that had history online. Um, so that was that. And, and it sort of bleeds into your second question because Again, like I said, and it, and it was a surprise to me, I thought I was going to find more just people who were de dealing drugs on the Silk Road because they like drugs. And I just, I kept looking for those people and I couldn't find them. Everyone I met was political. And, you know, this guy, the guy in red, who's, who's A, one of the largest heroin dealers on Silk Road, but also was one of the chief technical architects of Silk Road, was, you know, political. And I can't say more than that, but very political and, and had a history in politics and cyber and all of that. Um, and so they wanted to talk because they did Silk Road. And if you were on the Silk Road forums, I don't know if any of you were back when Silk Road was running, it was almost all political discourse on Silk Road. Or 
it was talking about drug safety and drugs from a community standpoint. And what's interesting about this movie when it does piss people off is, is that it's, it's an unpalatable thing to discuss, right? Like what if you are a drug dealer and like this guy, you actually are a heroin user, which he is, and you're trying to help your customers not overdose. That's just an extremely unpalatable thing to talk about. And, and people will watch him be like, oh, fuck that, he's full of shit. It's like, I know him really well. He's, you may not like him, but he's not full of shit. Like, he's, he's done a lot of stuff to try to help, and there were other doctors on the Silk Road who were trying to help people. It's not to say it's a great thing. It's simply to say that someone like Neil Franklin, who's the, the executive director of Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, who speaks so eloquently in the film, you know, these people really believe that drugs drug markets online are the future for everyone's benefit, right? The users and to dismantle the drug war. Then you go to people like Chris Sigourney from the ACLU or Cindy Cohn from EFF who feel like the dark net gets demonized and you know, it should be, you know, shouldn't be demonized and there's a lot of good that's going on. But then you say, okay, well then does that mean Silk Road is a good thing? And most of the people I just mentioned will run for the hills, right? Because, but that's, that's different. That's like drug dealers and it's crime and it's like all this horrible shit. I'm like, you can't have one without the other. You can't, you can't, there has to be, it's gotta start somewhere and it's usually very radical, criminal or sort of beyond the law type people that aren't easy to put in one box or another that start these types of services that will evolve into services that we all embrace. And I watched that happen with Napster with all these people that thought Napster was horrible, it was evil, these guys were evil. And then Steve Jobs like picked Napster up out of the ashes, hired everybody, brought them into the iTunes store made a swindling deal with the record industry and suddenly he's okay, you know? And what he did is, that's cool. And they're building a giant ass building up north, you know, with all the proceeds from that. Well, you wouldn't have had that without Sean Fanning, who everyone views as a criminal. It's impossible, but it's unpalatable to society. To society, we don't like that. We like to wait out these, these guys that rush through the door that we think are unpalatable until somebody a bit more palatable shows up and picks up the ashes of these technologies and makes them palatable. And that's part of why I wanted to tell the story the way that I did, which is, you may not like them, but they are necessary. Yeah, that's a really great question. And, and I think we address it pretty well in the movie, because for me, the person who actually says the thing that I think nails this thing is Cody. You know, because Cody says, look, the libertarians can't handle the fact that what if DPR, and he doesn't go far as to call it Ross, he doesn't know whether Ross is DPR. What if DPR did try to kill those people, right? And nobody was killed. So there, there were no bodies, there were no deaths, there were no murders, but there does seem to be somebody, whether it was corrupt law enforcement agents or DPR or Ross, we don't know. There's such a tangled mess behind the veil of Silk Road that was engaged in a murder corruption plot. Cody says, Okay, let's assume that was DPR. Well, I still say he's a hero. In fact, I say he's more of a hero because he did that. That's what I would like to think I would do if I was in his position. Because to me, DPR is a revolutionary. He's not just some libertarian who wants to create a unregulated marketplace and screw the government. No, this guy's actually revolutionary. He wants to topple shit and he's willing to go the distance to do it. And I think that that's an important notion to contemplate. Again, it isn't to say that's good or that's bad. Cody's aware of the provocative nature of that statement. Cody is largely about provocation, but it's not empty provocation. He likes to get people to think. Is how far are you willing to go to have the society that you want? And how far does one have to go in order to achieve that aim? And it, it isn't to say, I mean, most people get very black and white. They get very dialectical, like, well, are you saying that's good? Well, that's a terrible thing. It's like, no, it's not about good or bad. It's just a fact of if you're going to do something revolutionary, you're going to have to face some really difficult choices. What are you going to do when you face those choices? And what does that mean about your legacy? I've also seen libertarians, some libertarians, argue that it was an act of self-defense, or would have been an act of self-defense, that an informant working for the state who's going to put you in prison is that, has actually initiated aggression. Right, I mean, th yeah. I thought it was a fairly persuasive argument, actually. Yeah. I'm not, I don't have any information. The, the, I don't know anybody's name, and the media that, that you see of that guy is all that exists now. I, I've destroyed all of it. So there's no 
uncolor corrected media of that guy. It was just that, just baked in silhouette. And they have it because it's out. You know, and I, there is no other, there's no there there. Um, so uh, I, I believe if, if they felt I had anything of any value, they would have come to me a long time ago. The thing after I dealt with this with the Napster story, you have to remember, they won as far as why do they want to talk to me? Guy's going to jail for the rest of his life. What else do they want to do? You know, they don't care. The, the reality of it is, is they don't care about these guys. They sell a penny ante amount of drugs. They care about, you know, the dude in Mexico that just waltzed through a mile-long tunnel <laughs> who's actually doing stuff with the drug trade. These guys are like street corner guys as far as they're concerned. Yeah, I mean, there was a, the, if you go to Reddit, it's, it's very deep with everybody talking about what happened. And there's a lot of people there that were heavily involved in Silk Road. It's not just trolling. In fact, that's how I found a, a ton of people. Um, I was able to verify them with, with PGP, but um, there's a lot. There are people that went to jail that got out of jail that are now freely talking about what happened who were core architects of the Silk Road. You know, uh, there's a lot of, of discourse about all of that there. Um, it's just, you know, a lot of people, uh, there's nobody really giving those ideas voice in the media. So that spark doesn't catch in terms of the public, uh, public's awareness. It's really what you would consider underground discourse. But all of the sort of aspects of the Silk Road, if you go digging, are there. I mean, people are talking about it every day. There's tons of Silk Road discourse going on every day, and there has been since, you know, before Silk Road went down. Um, but the narrative has been very fixed, and, uh, you know, partly due to an agenda and partly due to just ignorance. People just get really confused about this stuff. They don't know how to write about it. I mean, I, I kept talking to people from the New York Times, all these different people like, you know, just call us. We'll put a consultant in your, in your newsroom. We'll explain to her. You know, nobody called. Nobody gave a shit. Nobody told stories that made any sense. I mean, it's not partisan to say that Reason was one of the only places that covered this thing. It was like three or four people. It was nobody outside the courtroom when he got sentenced. Nobody cared. So, you know, there, there is tons of discourse. It just doesn't get any airtime. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Great film. Yeah.